Welcome everybody to the uh, Fit Bucks podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, welcome there. If you're watching on Instagram or Facebook, welcome there also. Today we got an awesome episode on the podcast. I'm really excited for it. A lot of you have been asking me about my opinion about what's going on with the housing market, how much do I think it's going to fall. That's what we're going to be talking about. Basically forecasting the rest of 2022 and 2023 with the housing market, what's going to be happening couple things before we get started. First of all, I got to say this because of compliance. Anything you hear on this episode today is not a recommendation or anything like that. Okay. You still have to do your own stuff. Um, but I have to disclose that. Okay. Second of all, um, you know, of course, we're trying to help everybody as many people as we can. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure that you subscribe to the channel, hit the notification button. So you're notified when the new stuff comes out, share it with your friends. If you're watching, um, on Instagram, Make sure you follow us um, at Fitbucks Official. Same thing with that at uh, Facebook. And of course, if you're listening on the podcast, make sure that you subscribe. And of course, like I said, no matter what channel you're on, share this with your friends, share the, the company with your friends. It helps us grow. It's definitely appreciated. Like I said, this is a fun episode. I'm going to be talking about you know, what I think, um, how far the, the market's going to go down. Now, the reason why I'm stoked and I'm super excited about this, um, as you guys know, um, I'm a CFA charter holder. So valuation work, all that type of stuff, that's my background. Investing, that's my background. Valuing businesses, that's my background. Valuing, valuing real estate, that's my background. That's what we're going to be doing today. I'm, I'm doing an analysis. like this, And so I'm like back in my real house because I don't get to do this stuff that often anymore because I'm so gun ho building all the tech with, with uh, Fitbucks to help you guys out and all that stuff that this is like going back to my roots. Okay. Now to do this, like in, in the investment world, Guys that, that I used to talk with and work with and stuff, I'm going to show you what we used to call a back of the napkin type of analysis. And what that means is that I'm not going to build out. So most of like the, the models I used to build in Excel would be like 40 to 100 tabs with a bunch of data all over the place. It's not like that. We're basically just saying this is back of the napkin, meaning I, I could get a napkin and just write out some some formulas and some numbers and come up with a high level valuation or some type of analysis. That's what we're doing today. Okay. I mean, I'm going to be doing it with real estate because a lot of you guys have been asking me, like, should I buy now? Should I wait? Like, should I invest in it? Like, what's going on? Like, blah, 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 blah. How far do I think it's going to go down? That's the question I keep getting asked constantly. Let's dive right into it. This back of the napkin type of an analysis. Now, when it comes to real estate, we got to do this two different ways, right? Because who's buying real estate? You have two types of people for this type of analysis. You have those that are going to be using debt and you have those that are going to be using cash. Okay. So those are our two different analysis that you have to do. And if you're watching on YouTube or Instagram, you guys can see my screen. Um, so you can see these numbers. Okay. Don't jump ahead. Like I'll get to the numbers. If you're listening on the podcast, I'm going to walk you through these numbers and I know it's hard, but I'm going to try to go slow so that way you can digest the numbers and understand what they are. Now with this back of the napkin thing, I did this for the area that, that I live in. Okay. Every market's a little bit different, but the same mechanisms you can do anywhere. Okay. Now the price of the estimated value of the house I live in just about a half hour outside of Austin at the height of everything. It's about $850,000. Okay, now, <laughs> my house is not worth eight hundred fifty dollars I've been saying it for a long time. We, we bought the house three years ago for like $360,000, and it went up to eight fifty dollars in three years. I, I just, you know, a year ago, I, I could have told you that this is ridiculous. There's going to be a crash. I, this is just insane. And it was like, everybody's moving to Texas. I get it, but to go up 3x in three years makes no sense whatsoever. Or 2.5x, whatever it is. It makes no sense. Okay. People are like, are you excited about the wealth in the house? Like, no, I can't use it. Like I can't take out the wealth out of my house and use it to invest in stocks. Like, well, what's the big deal? So anyways, at the height was $850,000 in value. Okay. Now these numbers are not, not going to be exact because I'm, I'm assuming a first time home buyer's loan, which at 850 grand, you're not going to be able to qualify for an FHA loan. But for the sake of this, I'm going to, that's the loan that I used. So that means that on an $850,000 house, it's an eight hundred and twenty thousand uh, dollar mortgage. Okay. Now at the time, you know, most so many some people could get a lower interest rate than three point two five percent, some a little bit more. So I'm going to use three point two five percent in this analysis. 
And then I got to add in property tax. And the reason being is because when you qualify for a mortgage, they look at different things. They look at like your, your mortgage payment, your property tax payment, your student loan payment, your HOA uh, fee, your title and insurance. All that stuff goes into it and it's factored into your DTI ratio. I'm just including the two big ones, which is tax and the interest or the monthly payment um, into this analysis. Because like I said, this is a back of the neck analysis, not a death, right? Um, some of you, if you have like student loan payments and that type of stuff, if you're doing this personally, you would do it. But again, this is not for you personally. This is just strictly for a back of the napkin. How much do I think real estate is going to drop? So those other things like student loans and all that stuff, that's personal. The interest rate and the tax of the house, that applies to everybody. So that's why I'm using those in the back of this, this napkin valuation. So that means on a monthly amount, that's 5164 a month. Now at a 50% DTI ratio, which by the way, it's really high. I would never suggest any of you buying a house with a 50% DTI ratio, okay? That's debt to income, that's huge, okay? That would give me an implied income of $124,000, okay? So what that means is that for the people that were using debt, Buying a house in the area that I live in, they would have to have an income of $124,000 a year. Again, houses were overpriced. Were they making one hundred twenty-four? dollars I guarantee you they weren't. People were getting leveraged even more than that. It was ridiculous. But anyways, that doesn't matter on this analysis. Is It just helps us get to the next step, okay? So the first piece of that back of the napkin analysis is get to that income level and the monthly payment level and all that, that type of stuff. The next piece then says, okay, Interest rates are not at 3.25% anymore. So if we hold everything else constant and all we do is increase the interest rate to what they are right now, 6.25%, then that means the loan size is $579,000. So it goes from 820 to 579 for the loan, which again, if that's an FHA loan, that gives me a house value of about $600,000. So it went from 850 down to 600 is what I'm projecting based on these numbers. That's a 30% decrease. That's the key number. I'm looking at a 30% decrease in, in that situation, okay? And so like, if I'm looking at like, cause I, I'm actually been looking at this now saying, hey, should we should we buy some houses in the next 12 months? What am I looking for? That's why I did this back of the analysis, back of the napkin analysis, it's actually for myself and to share it with all you guys. But, but again, like I wanna know, should I be buying potentially a house or something to rent in a few few months, okay? So that's 30%. Now what happens though is that you can say, well, in this back of the napkin analysis, that's 6.25% right now. But this is where you start saying your personal stuff. Like the Fed has already said they're going to keep raising rates and all that type of stuff. You know, mortgage rates are tied to the Fed a little bit, but not 100%. But maybe I just say, look, I think actually mortgage rates are going to go up to like 6.75. So that would then put me down to a 33% decrease and the home price is right around 565 to 575. So again, splitting hairs on that, the big thing is, is at back of the neck of analysis, I'm just trying to get a general number, negative 30%. So I already know, let it be my house, um, because my house was on the upper end because of, of, I mean, we had a daughter, so we wanted a big yard and all that type of stuff. So when we bought it, 380 was like the higher end, the rest of the house was like 325. So even the 850 value was high. Most of the other area, uh, houses in my area were probably right around like 740-ish in that range at the peak. I don't care though. I'm looking at the 30%. Okay. So like if I come in here and I say, Hey, like 740 was the high, that means I'm looking at the other houses that I might buy and rent like a three bedroom, two bathroom type of house of, you know, maybe 520 ish, like 550 would be appropriate value. So if I start seeing houses around 520 ish, I might be like, Hey, we're getting there. Like this is, might be a good time to buy. What was my analysis now? Okay. Now, that's the home buyer. Again, I know if you guys are listening on the podcast, you're not seeing these numbers. And this is, again, some some stuff that's like, well, where are you getting these numbers from? Again, if you guys have you know any comments, you guys can always put them in the comment box. I can deeper dive and show you some of those numbers, why I use them. Again, the key thing is this is a back of the napkin type of analysis. It's not some in-depth like economic analysis. Yeah, that's not what I do. I'm actually showing this to you guys to prove a point that you could probably do something very general like this as well and start coming up with some decisions on your own also, okay? Now, that was a debt buyer, 30%. Now, most of the time, okay, 
because of leverage, the debt buyer is going to be a lower decrease in this example. So like negative 30%. So for a cash buyer, I'd actually think that it might have to drop even more. Let's see if I'm going to be correct on that. Okay. So now though, you have to say, hey, I'm paying cash. So there's no rent or no uh, mortgage expense, but there's rent. So I collect rent. And in my area, you can rent a house for about $2,500 a month. So that's about $30,000 a year. Now, in taxes, I'm paying about $19,000 in taxes. So that means that my cash flow a year before like maintenance expenses, and everything else, just high level cash flow. Again, not an in-depth analysis, just I'm trying to get to a high level number. My high level cash flow, if I bought a property back then, would be $10,875. Okay, that would be the cash on cash return. So if I took ten thousand dollars, ten thousand eight seventy five, and divide that by the purchase price, which is eight fifty, that means at the height of the market, the cash on cash returns that the investors were looking at was about one point two eight percent. Okay, now in order to do this analysis, I then have to go and say, well, at that time, what was the standard? What was the the ten year Treasury rate at? And it was about 0.6% because I have to get to a spread. And you're going to see why in a minute. So I, what I do is I take that cash on cash return, 1.28%, and subtract out the 0.6 because that was the treasury rate. So the spread was 0.68%. Why is that important? Today, the 10-year treasury rate is now 3.57%. So it went from 0.6 to 3.57%. But I have to increase that number to figure out what the cash on cash return would be as today. So now I add the spread back. So the desired cash on cash return is 4.25%. Okay. So my cash on cash return, because interest rates have gone up, went from 1.28% to 4.25. Now, some of you, I'm going to pause right there. Some of you might be like, well, why did it go up? Why would somebody want to get 1.28% cash on cash versus 4.25? Well, think about this. At the time, let me back up actually. Treasury rates are considered risk-free investments. Okay, they're you know you can argue that, but that's what in the finance world we consider the treasury rates as risk-free. So if treasury rates went from 0.6 to 3.57, but I can only get 1.28% on real estate, that means I, I'm taking risk with real estate, and that risk was going to pay me less than what the 10 year treasury would be. Nobody would do that because the treasury, the risk, risk free, I can make 3.57% risk free. Why, do I, why would I go into something with risk at 1.28%? That doesn't make any sense, right? So that's why we say, hey, the risk free rate is 3.57 now, but to be compensated for the risk that I'm taking, I have to add a number to that. That's why I got the spread. And so it's 4.25%. Uh, cash on cash return is what, Based on those numbers, based on at the peak, what an investor would want. Now, I'll pause there again. A real in-depth analysis would turn around and say, well, the times are different. People were taking more risk there. People are not taking as much risk now. So that spread should actually be higher. So my cash on cash would actually be higher, my desired return. But again, this is a back of the napkin type of analysis. So I'm just gonna say, that let's just keep everything constant. What would that imply? Well, if that goes to 30, again, rent was $30,000 a year, property tax. Um, I'm going to drop a little bit because the home price is going to drop that property tax. What does that come out to for this for the desired cash on cash return? A $460,000 value or a 54% decline from the high. Okay, so that's my back of the napkin analysis. In my general area, in, over the next year, if everything stays constant, meaning the interest rate is at 6.25%, based on the previous data from about a year ago, and if I extract that data to now to do a back of the napkin analysis, I'm looking at a 30 to 50% decline in home values in my area. So like a house my size, you know, my exact house, I would be looking at a value between $460,000 and $570,000. So just based on that, I might take like a midpoint. Hey, once it gets around 520-ish, yeah, that might be a really good buying opportunity depending on what else is going on. Now, I mentioned to you guys some of the other houses in the area topped out at like 740. So let's look at that. That would imply 
a range of housing between like 412, uh, 412,000 and about 520,000. So maybe if I'm looking for a smaller house that I could just buy and rent out, once it got to about 460, 475, that's when I would probably say, hey, I, I want to buy this because I think it might go down a little bit, but I'm not trying to time the bottom. Timing the bottom is, is a loser's game. Like, I'm just trying to, to say what's the general direction and then, hey, can I get around the bottom? And that's what this back of the napkin type of valuation does is say, what is around that bottom? What is around that bottom? Now, now that I have this back of the napkin valuation, if I want to change like interest rates around to say, hey, I think also that maybe mortgage rates might drop or maybe this spread is not right. Maybe the spread should be higher because, uh, you know, it's a different time now. Um, I could do that, but I don't need to. This is good enough for me. You know, I've already told my wife, hey, just keep out, uh, you know, eyes on real estate prices. But that's what we're looking at. So from a high level, to answer you guys' questions on a lot of what we have been getting, so as I mentioned to you guys at the beginning of this, about when, like, how much do I think housing is going to go down? In my area, and I can extrapolate this probably out to the U.S. as well, I think housing prices are going to go down from the peaks between 30 and 50%. Uh, I know it's a wide range. Some people are going to be like, oh, why don't you say it's going to be below, like they're going to drop between zero and 100%, like, right? Like, and be a smart ass, which I do that too sometimes to people. But I'm not trying to get a really concise window. For me, what I've learned with investing is you can never really time the bottom. You can never really time the top. So like if you look at a scale of zero to 100, okay, and you take off 20% from each side, so 20 and 80. If you can buy at 20 and constantly sell at 80, you're going to make a lot of money. You don't need to go all the way down to zero and you don't need to sell at 100. You just need to go near the bottom, near the top. If you do that, you're going to make a lot of money. And that's what this is for in terms of what I wanted to do today in this back of the napkin type of thing of saying back of the napkin. And again, if like I sat down with a real analyst and I show this to them, they'll be like, there's so many flaws in this, blah, 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 blah. blah. And here's the reality of it. I can sit down for five hours Five days. Those other analysts can sit down for five days, build out complex models, and guess what? The predictions are going to be a negative 30 to 50% drop on the top. Like, it's going to be in that range somewhere. So why go through all the headache? That's why I do these back of the napkin types of valuations. And as you get better at these, you can actually do them very quickly. Um, you know, I've done them with COVID, with like stocks, and all that type of stuff where it's like, yeah, this, I don't need the time to bottom, put, it in, put the money in, sell it now, whatever it is, like... Let's go. All right. So that is the podcast today. That is the, the YouTube video for today. I hope you guys liked it. Again, my analysis, negative 30 to negative 50%, somewhere in that range. If I'm going to be doing an investment, if everything stays the way it is right now, that's what I'm looking for. It's in that range that, you know, because I'd probably buy a cheaper house if I was going to be invest or renting it out too. Uh, so I'm looking in my area between four hundred twelve and five hundred thousand dollars. Once it gets into that range, I'll be looking. Hope you guys do too. Thanks for joining us on the podcast again. If you're on YouTube, subscribe. Podcast, subscribe. Instagram, follow us. See you guys next time.